would just love you so much, and we thank you for Brother John, and we pray that these people are doing powerful now, and they can make themselves susceptible to that. Okay, uh, turn to your neighbor, and you're going to say to them, Le Val Shalane.
I remember when we first started camp, uh, we actually went with a sister church to a camp up in Colorado. And we went to that camp and, you know, we brought in, we had, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 kids and brought 20 or 30 adults like we, you know, do like you see around here. Um, and that a lot of those churches that we were with had one, had the youth minister that went with them. That was it. He had more kids than we did, I think, 40 or 50 kids. And I just remember, um, you know, making a friendship with him, having a friendship with him and, and uh, us considering going back to that camp the next year only to hear that he had burnt out and moved on. And here's a guy who had a, a seminary degree, he was hired by a, a church to, to have a career uh, spent doing ministry. And again, only to hear within a year that he had burnt out and moved on. He had busted out of the gates, I think, in, uh, with the mindset of his friend, only to realize that uh, that, that brings out burnout pretty quickly. And countless others have walked through our ministry with the same mindset. They come in with uh, really high hopes and expectations, which are great in and of themselves. Uh, but you know, when you do that and you don't have the foundation under it and the relationships to support it and the mindset to grow, you run into some problems. And countless teenagers have sat in your seat with the very same feeling. That's right. Uh, Ronnie mentioned it yesterday. We have teenagers who come into camp um, within, a, within a month of getting back you know, they've fallen back into uh, the lifestyle or the decisions that they were making before. And so I'm here to tell you today that you can be deeply devoted to God. Amen. Yeah. As a teenager, you can live a life that's deeply devoted to God. Yeah. And so we're going to go back in the Old Testament and read, read a story in 2 Chronicles chapter 14, starting in 14. And I'm just going to, I don't have any really minister, or, uh, sermon notes today. I'm just going to preach and teach from the scripture directly. I've got some notes here in my Bible. And I'm going to try and help you draw a correlation between your life and the life of King Asa. Um, to give you just a little bit of background, uh, there are a lot of kings in the history of Israel. Um, without going into a, a huge explanation of that, really all you need to know is that there were a bunch of kings at this point. Uh, and a lot of them were bad. A lot of those kings were bad. These were God's people, yet they did and made decisions that were very, very bad. Uh, and led their nation, led their people astray. And one of the things that's interesting, if you look at a list of all the kings in the, in the history of, of the, the Jewish nation, uh, and you put green on the good kings and red on the bad kings, uh, the page is overwhelmingly red. It's surprising how few uh, kings who were really seeking God's heart uh, were, were back in that time. And so I'm just going to read to you from the scripture. Um, we're just going to kind of work our way through this. I've got a couple points that I want to make along the way and some challenges for you. Um, but I want you to jot down this uh, Second Chronicles chapter 14, uh, uh, chapters 14 through 16 in your notes. And I want you to go back and read this um, you know, whenever you're feeling challenged or considering uh, taking a different path than the one that we're <coughs> presenting to you up here. So starting in 14, verse 1, When Abijah died, he was buried in the city of David. Then his son Asa became the next king. So Abijah was the king and father uh, before Asa. And uh, he was a, a little sketchy, uh, I think, to say the least. But anyway, um, Asa came into the, the kingship, and there was peace in the land for ten years. For Asa did what was pleasing and good in the sight of the Lord. Now this is going to be a, a kind of a constant theme that you're going to see and might want to just jot down. That when, when the people did what was pleasing to God, they had peace in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so the, the teenage life is naturally tumultuous. Yes. It is naturally um, a, a very tough life. Those years that you're living there are tough to get through. Yes. But you need to know that if you do what's right in the eyes of the Lord, you will have peace in your life. Sure. Yeah. And that's a really strong and profound statement that we've seen play out over and over again in our ministries and in our relationships. Starting in verse 3, he removed the pagan altars and the shrines. He smashed the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah poles. And so what they're referring to here are idols that the kings before him 
had put up for the people to worship in place of worshiping Jehovah God. And so Asa goes in here and he starts cleaning house. He starts, you know, right off the bat. You said, you know, you saw there in the beginning, he was in there 10 years, but he comes in now and he's really cleaning house, taking out the things that, that are in front of people's relationship to God. So again, I'm going to stop a lot along the way and just try and draw the correlation for you. But you guys are in a lot of friendships that need house cleaning. That's right. You guys are, are in relationships that need you to say one little thing. That need you to show them one little thing, one little commitment to God. And that could in turn change the, the whole outcome of their lives. Mm -hmm. So he commanded the people of Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and to obey his laws and his commands. Asa also removed the pagan shrines as well as the incense altars from every one of Judah's towns. So Asa's kingdom enjoyed a period of peace. Again, just highlight that there. That, uh, that when people did what God expected them to do and did that well, that they enjoyed peace in their, in their lives. And I'll also just make a quick suggestion here that if you don't have peace in your life, there may be some things that you need to go in and clean out. Right. Maybe sure. some things that you have to really look at. You know, because again, the teenage life is full of a lot of different things and drama tends to kind of rise to the top. So if you see that you have a lot of drama in your life, if you see that you have relationships that are constantly up and down and in flux, you know, look for opportunities to go in and clean those up and see if God doesn't give you that peace. During those peaceful years, he was able to build up the fortified cities throughout Judah. No one tried to make war against him at this time, for the Lord was giving him rest from his enemies. Asa told the people of Judah, Let us build towns and fortify them with walls, towers, gates, and bars. The land is ours because we sought the Lord our God, and he has given us rest from our enemies. So they went ahead with these projects and brought them to completion. <clears throat> King Asa had an army of 300,000 warriors from the tribe of Judah, armed with large shields and spears. He also had an army of 280,000 warriors from the tribe of Benjamin, armed with small shields and bows. Both armies were composed of courageous fighting men. So they had an army combined there of roughly a half a million people, half a million men. Okay. Once an Ethiopian named Zerah attacked Judah with an army of a million men and 300 chariots. You can see how this story is kind of setting up. These guys were severely outnumbered. And one of the things I've heard from teenagers a lot through the years is that, is that they don't have any uh, group of friends at school. Even if they wanted to go in and really make a statement, a bold statement for the kingdom, they walk in there and it's them. It's them. They don't have any other friends. But I'll just make a quick statement that I know you guys are going to love, and I know you're, you've heard it before. If it's just you and God, you've got them outnumbered. Yeah. 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 You've got them outnumbered. And the, the, the neat thing that you can do in those situations is pray for God to give you victory. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to see that here in a second. And victory, guys, is not just, well, I said no, and somebody asked me to go to a party. That's not, that's not the victory, although that can be a victory. The victory is that he'll bring you friendships. Yeah. He'll bring you people into your life that will help you through those situations. You think you're outnumbered? Who cares? No big deal. You've got the God of the universe on your side who can help you through those situations. Yeah. So here comes this guy with an army of a million men, and they advance to the city of Maresha. To eight, um, so Asa deployed his armies for battle in the valley north of Maresha. Then Asa cried out to the Lord, his God. If you're writing this in your Bible, following off along in your Bible, underline, cried out. He cried out to the Lord, his God. O oh Lord, no one but you can help the powerless against the mighty. Help us. O oh Lord, our God, for we trust in you alone. It is in your name that we have come against this vast horde. O oh Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere men prevail against you. What a powerful, powerful battle cry that you are just as capable of as this king from many, many years ago. No one but, can, no one but you can help the powerless against the mighty. So it's a, it's a foregone conclusion that you're going up against a very difficult situation. 
You know, you're bombarded every day through social media and our regular media with all kind of messages that are completely counter to the kingdom of God. And you have a choice of whether or not you let those messages affect your life. That's it. That's a choice that you make. You wake up every morning and make that choice. And some of the practicals behind that, guys, is limit your time on social media. Limit your time watching TV or going out and being involved in those things of the world. Yeah. The more you're around those things, the more you're going to be like that. Sure. Ronnie said it yesterday. I can tell how a young person is going to be by the friends that he or she surrounds themselves with. So cry out to the Lord. Look for those opportunities to cry out to God and ask for victory. And so I love just the beginning of the next the next script, the next verse here. So the Lord defeated the Ethiopian. You know, it's like, yeah, so, so you did that. <laughs> because this is Jehovah God, the, the king of the universe that can do whatever he wants. Half a million versus a million? No big deal. One teenager in a school of thousands? Mm -hmm. No big deal. He'll bring you together as Christians. You'll, you'll see other opportunities to, to connect with people who believe and think like you do. Yeah. It just takes the courage, and remember that word from here in a second, it takes the courage for you to make those decisions. So the Lord defeated the Ethiopians in the presence of Asa and the army of Judah, and the enemy fled. Asa and his army pursued them as far as Gerar. And so many Ethiopians fell that they were unable to rally. They were destroyed by the Lord and his army. And the army of Judah carried off vast quantities of plunder. While they were at Gerar, they attacked all the towns in that area. And the terror from the Lord came upon the people there. As a result, vast quantities of plunder were taken from these towns too. They also attacked the camp, camps of the herdsmen and captured many sheep and camels before finally returning to Jerusalem. Chapter 15. Then the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, son of Oded, and he went out to meet King Asa as he was returning from the battle. Listen to me, Asa, he shouted. Listen, all you people of Judah and Benjamin, the Lord will stay with you as long as you stay with him. Whenever you seek him, you will find him, but if you abandon him, he will abandon you. Sure. So the Lord will stay with you as long as you stay with him. You know, we're not getting in at this point to the theology of salvation or anything like that. What we're simply talking about here is that when you leave this camp, you're leaving with God. Because you, you've taken God in here. You've experienced God here. You've been with God. You've sought Him while you're here. And you've found Him. There's no reason, absolutely no reason, you can't recreate this same thing back home. The Lord will stay with you as long as you stay with Him. For a long time, Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach them, and without God's law. But if, whenever you were in distress and turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought Him out, you found Him. During those dark times, it was not safe to travel. Problems troubled the nation on every hand. Nation fought against nation, and city against city, for God was troubling you with every kind of problem. And now, you men of Judah, be strong and courageous. For your work will be rewarded. You know, just again, think about the, the different situations that you guys find yourselves in. You know, maybe at home. Um, certainly in your schools. Maybe in the jobs that you work in. And you see this kind of dark times that are, are listed out in this scripture. And the encouragement and challenges. And now you, men of Judah, now you, students of Wiley High School, students of Garland High School, or wherever your school is, you be strong and courageous. For your work, it will be rewarded. Amen. When Asa heard this message from Azariah the prophet, he took courage and removed all the idols in the land of Judah and Benjamin, and in the towns he had captured in the hill country of Ephraim. Hey, you notice something here? He's still removing <laughs> idols. He's still cleaning things out. He's still becoming more and more devoted and drawing people around him to be more and more devoted. See, the opposite of that in a teenage life is that you put up idols. And you join your friends to worship those idols. And you ask your friends to come and worship those idols with you. And you expect then for God to bless you and for His Spirit to be with you. When you put up those idols in your life, you're saying that that's more important to you than God is. Mm -hmm. 
And that's just, that's just a, a baseline observation, guys. But if you'll go in and continue to tear those things down, and then look for opportunities in your friends to tear those things down, you'll see the peace of God like you've never That's experienced right. it before. That's right. Except maybe on a mountaintop in Colorado. <laughs> you continue getting better. You know, there's, some, there's, there's something powerful about momentum. Um, I've used this illustration before, and I'll, I'll say it again because I think it's super powerful. If you, if you just envision a super big metal wheel, okay, and it's suspended, and you can walk over to it, and if you push on it a little bit, it's not going to move. But if you keep pushing, keep pushing, you'll see it move just, I'm talking a wheel like this size, the size of this room, huge. And so this, this is your life. You walk over to this, walk with God, and you push and you push and you don't see any movement. And then friends come along, youth workers come in, you get plugged into the church body, and together you start pushing and pushing. And you see a fraction of an inch of movement. You started something. You started something profound. And if you keep pushing on that, you will keep moving that wheel. That wheel will continue to rotate. And finally, maybe after weeks and weeks of pushing, months and months for some people, years and years of pushing, that wheel will make a full rotation. That's right. Now you've got something. Now you've got something really working. That's what momentum is. And so you keep pushing on that wheel. And the more you push on it, the easier it goes around the next time. It may have taken a month for you to get it to go around one time. The next revolution in that, maybe a week. And down to a day, down to an hour. Until you get this momentum going. Now certainly there's sin that can be thrown into, that, into those cogs and cause that wheel to come to a stop. But it's a lot more difficult than when that wheel's not spinning at all. Yeah. And so remember momentum. You can see here with King Asa, he's got this momentum going. So then Asa called together all the people of Judah and Benjamin, along with the people of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon, who had settled among them. Many had moved to Judah during Asa's reign when they saw that the Lord his God was with them. People love the peace of God. Yeah, that's right. yeah. When you have that in your life, and when they see that in your life, you're going to have people coming to you that want to just be around you and talk to you. Just want to hear this peace that you have. The people gathered in Jerusalem in late spring during the 15th year of Asa's reign. On that, on that day, they sacrificed to the Lord some of the animals they had taken as plunder in the battle. 700 oxen, 7,000 sheep and goats. Then they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord the God of their ancestors with all their heart and soul. This is your people group. This is your youth group. This is your fellow Christians who are coming together to make this commitment. They agreed that anyone who refused to seek the Lord, the God of Israel, will be put to death. So you guys can do that sentence. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking this too far. This is your people group. You're bringing your people together to worship God. They shouted out their oath of loyalty to the Lord with trumpets blaring and horns sounding. When our youth groups gather in Garland or Denton or in Wiley, we need to have people outside need to hear this. Yeah, they sure. need to hear our battle cry. They need to know what we're about. Yeah. So they shouted out their oath of loyalty to the Lord, trumpets blaring and horns sounding. All were happy about this covenant, for they had entered into it with all their hearts. They had entered into it with all their hearts. Eagerly they sought after God, and they found Him. And the Lord gave them rest from their enemies on every side. King Asa even deposed his grandmother, Maka, from her position as queen mother, because she had made an obscene Asherah pole. He cut down the pole, broke it up, and burned it in the Kidron Valley. Although the pagan shrines were not completely removed from Israel, Asa remained fully committed to the Lord throughout his life. He brought into the temple of God the silver and gold and the utensils that he and his father had dedicated. So there was no more war until the 35th year of Asa's reign. This guy didn't keep his grandma out. You know, because his grandma wasn't worshiping the one true God. That's, that's the extent of this. That's the seriousness of what we're talking about. And Jesus, Jesus says something similar. You know, any man who comes after me must hate his father and mother. 
Now guys, remember, this is not about really going and doing that. It's about in comparison to your love for God, it should look like you hate the people who are closest to you because you love them more and more. You guys need to listen to your parents and you need to obey your parents. But if God is calling you to do something different, you listen to God. You do what God tells you to do. And obviously, when that happens, you should have gotten counsel on that from other godly people. Don't just go, oh, well, God told me to go to this party. You know, whatever. You know, you see what is right. That's right. You pursue the Lord. You get people around you who will speak truth into your life. So Asa started off good, and he continued good, didn't he? Yeah. Okay, let's see how he finished. In the 36th year of Asa's reign, King Basha of Israel invaded Judah and fortified the law in order to prevent anyone from entering or leaving King Asa's territory in Judah. Look at how Asa responded. Asa responded by taking the silver and gold from the treasuries of the Lord's temple and from the royal palace. He sent it to King Ben-Hadad of Aram, who was ruling in Damascus along with this message. Let us renew the treaty that existed between your father and mine. See, I'm sending you a gift of silver and gold. Break your treaty with the king, with King Basha of Israel so that he will leave me alone. But what did he do? Maybe I should ask, what did he not do? Ask God for help. Thank you, Devin. He did not call on the name of the Lord. He immediately, Asa responded by taking the silver. We should have read, Asa responded by calling on the name of the Lord. Because we remember how that turned out for him last time. But no, he, he took it into his own hands. He did his own deal. He sought friendship with men and safety uh, in, in human relationships before he did with God. ben agreed to King Asa's request and sent his armies to attack Israel. They conquered the towns of Ejon, Dan, Abelbeth, Makkah, and all the store cities in Naphtali. As soon as Basha of Israel heard what was happening, he abandoned his project of fortifying the law. Then King Asa called out all the men of Judah to carry away the building stones and timbers that Basha had been using to fortify the law. Asa used his materials to fortify the towns of uh, Jeba and Mizpah. At that time, Hanani the seer came to King Asa and told him, because you have put your trust in the king of Aram instead of in the Lord your God, you missed your chance to destroy the army of the king of Aram. Don't you remember what happened to the Ethiopians and Libyans and their vast army with all their chariots and horsemen? So who rolled into King Asa's life? A youth worker. A youth worker. Picked him up, took him to McDonald's, and sat down with him to have a coat. And he said, you've done something wrong here. Yeah. And he spoke truth into, into his life. Guys, you're going to hear some challenging things from your new world. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to hear corrections and rebukes that put you back on the right track. Don't get mad. Yeah. Yeah. Don't turn off the relationship. Pursue it deeply. Amen. Because you know what? You have somebody who's willing to step into your life and speak truth into your own yeah. right. And teach you how to be the man or the woman that God wants you to be. So this youth worker, Hen and I, stepped into his life and, and said those words. He continued on. At that time, you relied on the Lord, and He handed them all over to you. Listen. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. Leba Shalem. Leba Shalem. To strengthen those hearts who are Leba Shalem. Fully committed to God. What a fool you've been. From now on, you will be at war. From now on, you will be at war. So he tells them, hey, if you would seek, if you would have sought the Lord in this, you would have had victory. And I love this statement here. The eyes of the Lord search the whole poor earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. They love should I? Your God is constantly looking to strengthen you. Your God is constantly looking to, to better where you are. Now that betterment may take you through some difficult situations, but He has uh, put out a, a very sincere commitment. He's fulfilling His end uh, of the deal. He's fulfilling His end of the commitment.
You know, that pact, that covenant that he set up. Look at how Asa, re how Asa responded. Asa became so angry with him and I for saying this that he threw him into prison. That's what we do a lot in our relationships. When a youth worker comes in and speaks truth into our life, we throw him into prison. Yeah. We don't want to do that. We don't want to talk to them anymore. And again, my challenge to you is to hear those words and act on them. At that time, Asa also began to oppress some of his people. So let's close this out. The rest of the events of Asa's reign from the beginning to the end are recorded in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa developed a serious foot disease. Even when this disease became life-threatening, he did not seek the Lord's help, but sought only help from his physicians. So he died in the 41st year of his reign. He was buried in the tomb he had carved out for himself in the city of David. He was laid on a bed, perfumed with sweet spices and ointments, and at his funeral, the people built a huge fire in his honor. So a couple of points to take away, and then I'll close this up. Asa started well, and Asa continued well, but he didn't finish all that well. Now, I think it was neat there at the very last, you'll notice that the people built a huge fire in his honor. It's a statement of grace. You know, that they saw, even in his bad times, um, that he was still a good man who had sought after the Lord and done a lot of really good things. But he didn't finish well. And so the lessons I think from this are three. Don't forget God after your victories. Yeah, for sure. Don't forget God after your victories. Um, build them up more, push harder on that flywheel, get another uh, rotation on it, and continue on with the momentum uh, that he's giving you. The second lesson, seek God when the pain and hard times come. Mm -hmm. You know, remember, Asa's big problem his big uh, issue that he had and ended up starting a, just a downward spiral, spiral in his life is that he didn't seek the Lord in those times. Mm -hmm. In those difficult times, you know, after that 35th year, um, the pain came, the hard times came, and he did not seek the Lord. And then the last point is just to train for the long journey. Train for the long journey. Um, your walk with God is not a strength. Your walk with God is a marathon. Mm -hmm. And you need to train accordingly. You need to train for that. And it's little victories. It's those little victories along the way that will ultimately lead to something powerful. So I want to call you now um, to a Labas Shulane commitment. Um, Anna, will you come up? Anna is going to spend the next four or five minutes singing the song over you. And uh, there's nothing super special about this song. I just feel like the Spirit gave it to me uh, as I was preparing for the sermon. Uh, really, actually, very strong. The first time I heard this song, uh, I was probably 19. I was working in cheerleading camps, and uh, and it was a Christian cheerleading camp that we had. We had a time where uh, we did praise and worship every night. I heard a, a voice major sing this song, and it just uh, blew my mind. And so. I want Anna to sing this song over you, and as she's singing it, and uh, you want to, this is not, this is not about um, uh, me trying to pressure you into a commitment. Because I would tell you that over and over again. If I worked with you personally one-on-one, -on -one, I would not ever try and uh, pressure you into a commitment in a bad way. You know, a lot of times we apply good pressure. But, uh, but this is about Leibov Shalom. Remember, this is a covenantal term that means wholeheartedly devoted. And so I'm going to call you to devotion. I'm going to call you to this wholehearted devotion. Not just a simple and short-term thing. I want you to really think about this. I don't want you to just stand right up. And I don't want you to sing along with Mom. I don't want her to sing over you. It should be very quiet in here. But as you feel uh, that you're in a place to make this commitment, I just want you to stand up. I want the Spirit to... to Continue to work into your heart and as you see people stand up beside you. Um, maybe you can put a hand on their shoulder and pray for them. Uh, during that time, be praying for yourself. And, but I want to I call you to this slave option right now. But you'll remember, not just over the next couple days until the ink wears off of your skin, um, but that this will be something that's written on your heart. And that you remember it for the rest of your days. 
that you would take these lessons from this king of, of so long ago and learn how to live a life that's, that's fully committed, that's fully devoted to God. So again, the instructions are this, just in summary. As she's singing and you feel ready to make this Labok Shalane commitment, just stand up where you are quietly and continue to pray for yourself and those around you. And as the people around you stand up, maybe just put a hand on them and pray to yourself over them. Um, again, I'd like for it to be quiet so we can really hear the words of this song and let the Spirit move. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven? Thank you. 